I want to um, focus your attention this morning on two verses, two verses you have heard me read before, probably two of my favorite verses in the whole Bible. Uh, you'll understand why when I read them. Uh, this comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 15, which is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. Romans 8 is probably my favorite chapter, and Luke 15 is my second favorite chapter, probably. But the first two verses of Luke 15 say this. Tax collectors and other notorious sinners often came to listen to Jesus teach. This made the Pharisees and teachers of religious law complain that he was associating with such sinful people, even eating with them. So um, I've entitled this sermon. I'm not sure if this is going to be a one-week deal or a two-week deal, I'll know when I'm finished. If there are things that I left unsaid, I'll probably pick it back up next week. Um, but I've entitled it The Outsiders um, because that's who I believe I am. And in a sense, that's who I believe we are as a church. In 2019, Stacy and I moved here to create a place for people like us. We had experienced a lot of loss in our lives. Um, we had experienced a lot of crashing and burning in our lives. And we moved here to create a place for people like us, people well acquainted with failure and loss and disappointment and regret and grief and struggle and consequences and fear and sorrow. In other words, a place for real flesh and blooders, not people who as they want to be, but people as they are. I am not a, uh, not that this will be a big surprise to you, but I'm not a church guy. I'm not a religious guy. In fact, in the world of church and religion and stuff like that, I've always felt like a square peg in a round hole, always, my whole life, like a misfit. I've always felt like I needed to be better and cleaner to fit in with the church crowd. They never felt like my people, and I'm not necessarily blaming them. It was probably my fault, but I, I just, I always, I always felt like I didn't fit in. I really felt like I needed to be better, cleaner, more put together if I was going to be accepted by them. They've never felt like my people. It's never been my vibe. I, I never felt like I could totally be myself around them. Like I had to pretend in various ways that I was different than who I really am. Um, when I was in graduate school and seminary, I was uh, preparing to be ordained in a particular denomination, a uh, Presbyterian denomination. And once a year, that denomination gathers, uh, the entire denomination, thousands of people gather at a particular location. I think this year, the year I went was in Tampa. Um, and it was my first one. Never been to one before. Uh, I had a pastor friend of mine who invited me to go with him, and so I went. And it was, it was kind of a good first experience uh, of what my life was going to look like and who my people were going to be since I was pursuing ordination in this particular denomination. Uh, and as I sat there, I'll, I remember it like it was yesterday, as I sat there and looked around the room with all of those people, uh, I thought to myself, this isn't gonna work. <laughs> I mean, I don't look like these people. I don't talk like these people. These people are all buttoned up. I'm totally untucked. Uh, these people seem to have it all together. I'm a train wreck. I, I just, it made me question whether or not I was even pursuing the right thing. Um, I was astonished at how many pairs of khaki pants there were. Uh, and at the time, I didn't think I owned a pair of khaki pants. Uh, in fact, I think I showed up kind of like this, and they were looking at me like, uh, are you lost? Um, but I, um, I just, it was sort of dawned on me at that moment that I was up for an uphill battle uh, in terms of churchy stuff. The people that I feel most comfortable with are people who are honest, real, raw, it's one of the reasons why I love spending time at recovery places. 
uh, because those people are acutely aware of their own weaknesses. Uh, they've crashed, they've burned, they know what it feels like to lose, to fail. Uh, they're not afraid to show their humanness. I feel really comfortable around people like that. Um, people who aren't afraid to show their real selves, people who know that they're broken, people who know what it's like to lose. Those are the kinds of people I feel most comfortable with. And those aren't the types of people that are typically attracted to church and churchy things, sadly. So Stacy and I didn't come here to start some kind of a religious group. We came here to start a recovery place for humans. And we operate under the assumption that we're all in recovery, every single one of us. You don't have to be recovering from uh, alcoholism or drug abuse or sex or whatever, or eating, overeating. You don't have to be recovering from those typical things to be in recovery. Um, we've all been hurt. We've all been disappointed. We all have fears. We all have insecurities. We've all felt unloved and rejected in some way. We're all broken. So if you're human, you're recovering. We're all in this together. The difficult thing is to help people who don't think they're in recovery to see that they actually are. And you've heard me say this before. There are really two types of people in this world, people in recovery who know it and people in recovery who think they're not. But there's no one who's not in recovery. If you're a human being, you're, you're recovering from something, which is why I always say that the sanctuary is a recovery place masquerading as a church. I've been in church my whole life. I've led churches. I've led large churches. And I have never felt more free to be myself in life than I do at this place with you guys. Um, and it's a great demonstration, in my opinion, of just how uh, grace actually works. I'm going to get into it in a few minutes, but there's a huge difference between grace on paper and grace in practice. Lots of churches are great when it comes to grace on paper, but grace in practice is what should set churches apart from other institutions. Um, the sanctuary is like Festivus. It's a church for the rest of us, okay, if you're a Seinfeld fan. Um, you know, uh, the word sanctuary literally means rest. That's what it literally means. And we named this place the sanctuary because Stacy and I needed rest. We want to be a, a refuge. We needed a refuge and we wanted this to be a place of refuge, a place where it's safe to be real, to tell the truth about yourself without fear of rejection, a place where it's safe to bring your whole self, the self that laughs and the self that cries, the self that loves and the self that holds grudges, the self that dreams and the self that gets depressed, the self that is greedy and the self that is generous, the self that is confident and insecure, the self that is brave and scared your whole self, not just the good parts of you, but also the dirty parts of you, the messy parts of you, the bad parts of you. I know the word grace is heard a lot in church culture, but as I just said, there's a huge difference between grace on paper and grace in practice. Huge difference. Talking grace is easy, especially when everyone is behaving well. No perfect people allowed. We, we love mantras like that in church mission statements and on t-shirts. I have a story about that that I won't tell publicly, but if you want to know, come and ask me. Um, we love stuff like that. No perfect people allowed. It's enticing. Uh, it's a marketing tool. Um, but what we truly believe about grace is revealed in our response to someone's bad behavior someone's failure, someone's imperfections acted out. We can say we believe in grace all day long, but the real test is when somebody, maybe even somebody close to us, fails miserably. When friends or family members or colleagues or people that you know fail miserably, maybe they fail you miserably. They've acted out destructively and they've hurt you 
Um, that's when what we believe about grace becomes more apparent. And at least if you're anything like me, what you discover in those moments is that you don't believe in grace maybe as much as you thought you did. I mean, that's been true for me. I'm the grace guy. I talk about grace. I write books about grace. I, I sing about grace when we sing it here. Um, but, uh, but when something bad happens or something bad happens to me, when something destructive takes place in my life as a result of what someone else has done, someone else's negligence, then my belief in grace quickly goes out the window. Um, and, and so it's understandable that there's a huge difference between grace on paper and grace in practice. Um, when it comes to grace, there's usually an unspoken flat earth theory, okay? And what I mean by that is this. There's an edge or a horizon, and if you sail beyond that, if you screw up too badly, you'll fall off. Uh, and so grace has limits when you think about grace that way. I believe that God's grace has no edge. It goes round and round. It's it's eternal. And so I believe that the church should be the safest place to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth about ourselves. But all too often, it's the scariest, scariest place. It's a scandal to me, actually, a maddening scandal to me, that churches tend to be the most frightening places rather than the safest places for fallen people to fall down and for broken people to break things. Uh, I've said this before, but uh, and I experienced this nine years ago now almost, um, that people are typically fine when you say, as a church leader, as a pastor, as a preacher, they're typically fine. In fact, they're not just typically fine. They actually love it when you say, I'm a broken person just like you. I'm, I'm weak just like you. I'm no different than you in that regard. I'm, I'm broken and fallen too. They love that stuff because they feel like they can relate to you. Until that church leader does something that fallen and broken people do. And then oftentimes it's, exile. Um, and we do that to one another oftentimes. Um, a lot of churches think that God's primary goal for you is to make you good, that that's what this Christian thing is all about. It's, a, it's sort of a God-ordained self-improvement mechanism, um, and a lot, of, a lot of churches and a lot of people that go to church think that God's primary goal for you is to make you good, and so they don't know what to do with you when you're bad, when things in your life aren't good, when things are falling apart. The problem is that if you believe God's primary goal for you is that you be an example of goodness rather than a trophy of grace, you'll never be honest about your struggles, ever. You'll think, oh, my struggles are a bad witness to God. Um, and so you'll always feel the pressure to pretend that you're better than you are, always. And that's a miserable way to live, miserable. Someone once said that when you wear a mask, only the mask gets loved. And that's true. We all wear them. Um, we all wear them. I mean, I'll, I'll put one on as soon as I walk out the door, I'm sure. We just need one place once a week for one hour where it feels safe to take them off. We know our proclivities and our stubbornness, and we, we know that we're going we're gonna to fall backwards again, and we're going to put on our masks again, and we're going to keep secrets again, and we're going to hide the worst parts of ourselves again, we, and that's a, an enslaving way to live, but we're going to do it. You're going to do it this afternoon. I'm going to do it this afternoon. We're going to do it throughout the week. We just need one place once a week where we can come in and feel the safety to take them off. That's what we hope and pray the sanctuary is. The one place that should be the safest place to take off our masks is church. But as you know, maybe you don't. I, I do. Um, all too often, it's not. It's the scariest place. If your marriage is failing or you're in the middle of an affair or one of your kids goes off the deep end, are, are church people the first people you think to run to or the last? 
If you find out that your, your husband is addicted to porn or that your wife is an alcoholic or that your high school daughter is pregnant or that your business is failing and you have to declare bankruptcy, are church people the first people you run to or the last? What if you have a secret addiction or you're having a crisis of faith? You don't know if you believe this stuff anymore. Are Christians the first people or the last people you feel safe talking to about things like that? Well, historically and typically, churches have been the last place and Christians have been the last people that you think of when life is falling apart. We want this place to be the first, not the last. Let me tell you something. I've said this numerous times since we started. The only churches that will thrive in any meaningful way going forward. They can grow and get massive, but the only churches that will thrive in any serious way, in any meaningful way going forward, will not be castles of purity where only the morally fit feel comfortable, but rather basements of grace where all are embraced and forgiven, places where sin does not shock and grace still amazes. Those are the only places, in my opinion, that will thrive uh, going forward. Well, the two verses I read, uh, as I mentioned, are two of my favorite verses of the Bible, Luke 15, 1 and 2. And two obvious things pop out immediately in these two verses. Uh, the first thing to notice is the kind of people who were attracted to Jesus. Verse 1, the moral misfits, the spiritual outsiders, the unclean, the, the religious less thans, the people who couldn't get it right. Those are the people who flocked to Jesus. Those are the people who were attracted to Jesus. You know, we have uh, various ways church strategists and church leaders have various ways to gauge the health of a church these days. Church leaders talk about financial stability and growth and attendance and buildings and so on and so forth. But let me tell you, the real measure of church health is the presence of sinners who know they're sinners and misfits who know they're misfits. Outsiders who know that they're outsiders. The second thing to notice about these verses is not just the people who were attracted to Jesus, the people who flocked to him, the bad guys, you know. Um, but the second thing to notice is the kind of people who were appalled at Jesus. Verse 2, the religious people, the spiritual insiders, the, the people who thought they were good, the people who thought they were better. Those are the people who could not stand what Jesus was all about. What made the religious fit-ins furious was Jesus' derelict habit of befriending notorious sinners. It drove them nuts. In fact, most of them concluded that Jesus had to be an imposter because any self-respecting man of God would not hang out with people like this. He wouldn't talk this way and hang out with people like this. He wouldn't go to the places that he goes, and he wouldn't do the things that he does, and he certainly wouldn't hang out with the people that he hangs out with. See, and I think we get this wrong. Um, Jesus didn't come to prevent sinners from sinning, okay? If he did, he's done a pretty bad job, okay? Um, clearly, that wasn't his goal, okay? Jesus, and I think a lot of people think that's, what he did come to do. He came primarily to modify your behavior, to keep you from doing the bad stuff. Um, but Jesus didn't come to prevent sinners from sinning. He came to forgive them. <laughs> That's what he came to do. And that drives people who are all about behavior modification crazy. They think this whole thing our faith is all about becoming a better person. And the only way that we can conclude that we are becoming a better person is if we lower the standard significantly. Because if we keep the standard to where God has it, which is be perfect, 
as your Father in heaven is perfect, Jesus says in the Sermon on the Mount, um, then we quickly realize none of us are perfect and none of us are as good as we think we are. Uh, and God accepts us based on perfection, not progress. And it's not our perfection because we screwed that up a long time ago. It's Jesus's perfection, our substitute. So I've said this before and you've heard me say it perhaps a thousand times. Um, the foundation of the Christian faith is not your transformation. It's Jesus's substitution. Someone had to come and check the boxes. Someone had to come and be perfect. Someone had to come and do the right things in the right way, since we not only didn't do it, but we won't do it. Um, and Jesus came to do that. That's what gets us in with God. Not our behavior or how good we're becoming or however deluded we may think we, however deluded we may be to think that we're actually getting better and better and stronger and stronger um, when it comes to things pertaining to God. Um, anything short of perfection is failure in God's economy. So we need help and help came. That's what we celebrated at Christmas. That's primarily what we celebrated at Christmas. You see, what scandalizes people who think they're good is not who God leaves out, but who God lets in. <laughs> That's the thing that drives religious people nuts. Nuts. Um, I mean, my, there, are, there, are, there is no shortage of people in this world, okay, who think that it is a horrible thing, an abomination, that I'm a preacher because of the way that I crashed and burned in 2015. They, I disqualified myself for life. And I always like to say, man, I was disqualified long before 2015, buddy. Um, uh, and I mean, it just, it makes religious people crazy that God would see fit to welcome and embrace and forgive people who crash and burn and fail and bottom out. Uh, people who had responsibilities and who blew it and that God then works on and restores through his love and his grace and his forgiveness. Uh, that just, that, for people who are all about behavior modification and keeping the rules, grace sucks, okay? It's a threat to everything they're about, everything. And yet if that's not the way God related to us, we'd all be screwed, He's screwed. Um, the fact that God gravitates toward and embraces the immoral, the criminal, the blamable, the, the outcast, the liar, the cheater, the sexually deviant, that is what makes God himself such a religious misfit. As Mike Iaconelli once said, according to the religious leaders in Jesus' day, Jesus did God all wrong. <laughs> Went to the wrong places, said the wrong things hung out with the wrong people. So I don't mind if people, like the religious people in verse 2, I don't mind if people grumble and say that the sanctuary welcomes notorious sinners and eats with them. I love it. Love it. It's just, it's so punk rock. <laughs> and I dig it. Dig it. Um, a recovery place masquerading as a church. That's, that's who we are. And not everybody's going to like that. Uh, because in order for this to be a true recovery place where real people meet real grace, we have to begin admitting some hard truths about ourselves. We have to start looking at ourselves in the mirror and seeing that we're not all that, that we're more broken than we like to admit. And that is an ego blow, okay? Huge, huge blow to the ego. And so a lot of people don't like that. There's no real health or recovery that uh, goes along with avoiding that stuff, avoiding the, the truth about yourself, ignoring the truth about yourself, suppressing the truth about yourself. That's why I said I love recovery places because these are people who have tried to suppress the truth about themselves. They bottomed out as a result, and now they're at a place on the bottom, finally willing to admit that they're screwed up. 
And that is so healthy. I think that some of the people, regardless of what they struggle with or what they're recovering from, the people that I've met in recovery places who have bottomed out and who have finally come to a place of admitting that they need help are so much healthier than most church people who refuse to admit that stuff. So uh, I've said it before, and I'll say it again. It, it, given everything I just said, uh, I, I, if the sanctuary didn't exist, I don't think I'd go to church. And it's not because I don't believe in God or believe that God loves me. Or I, it's not because I don't believe that stuff. I do in my gut, in my heart, I do. Um, but it's just so hard to find the radicality of grace in religious places. So hard. So hard to find grace and practice in religious places. And the more you understand how much you're loved by God, the less you need other people's approval. And the less you need other people's approval, the more freedom you feel to be yourself. And there is nothing that compares with that kind of freedom, knowing that I am, I am loved by God, accepted by God, approved by God forever. And that frees me from needing your acceptance and your approval. And when I don't need your acceptance and your approval, I feel the freedom to tell the truth about myself more. Knowing that even if you walk away from me because you can't handle the truth, God never will, ever amazingly comforting and it makes you bold in all the right ways you know um i want to be we're gonna we're gonna take communion here in a few minutes which i can't wait i like tr like trey said i totally forgot it was even communion until yesterday afternoon but um but i want to read you something uh incredibly powerful um i i included this at the end of the the book that i just finished um I don't know if you know the name Jane Kristen Marshevsky. You may remember her as Nightbird. She was a singer-songwriter who won the hearts of fans in 2021 with an amazing performance of her song, It's Okay, on America's Got Talent. Um, but in 2017, she was diagnosed with stage three breast cancer. In 2018, she went into remission in 2019, she was diagnosed again with a three to six month life expectancy and a 2% chance of survival. She endured the pandemic and she endured a horrible divorce and then went to a clinic in Southern California. She miraculously recovered. Six months after her third diagnosis, she was declared cancer free and she died on February 19th, 2022 at 31 years old. And this was her blog entry posted one year before her death, and it is potent. She wrote this. I've had cancer three times now, and I've barely passed 30 years old. There are times when I wonder what I must have done to deserve such a story. I fear sometimes that when I die and meet with God, that he will say I disappointed him or offended him or failed him. Maybe, maybe he'll say, I just never learned the lesson or that I wasn't grateful enough. But one thing I know for sure is this. He can never say that he did not know me. I am God's downstairs neighbor, banging on the ceiling with a broomstick. I show up at his door every day, sometimes with songs, sometimes with curses, sometimes with apologies, gifts, questions, or demands. Sometimes I use my key under the mat to let myself in. Other times I sulk outside until he opens the door to me himself. I have called him a cheat and a liar, and I've meant it. I've told him that I wanted to die, and I've meant it. Tears, tears have become the only prayer that I know. Prayers roll over my nostrils and drip down my forearms. They fall to the ground as I reach for him. These are the prayers I repeat night and day, sunrise and sunset. Call me bitter if you want to, that's fair. Count me among the angry, the cynical, the offended, the hardened. But count me also among the friends of God. For I have seen him in rare form. I have felt his exhale laid in his shadow. 
squinted to read the message he wrote for me in the grout saying, I'm sad too. If an explanation would help, he would write me one. I know it. But maybe an explanation would only start an argument between us. And I don't want to argue with God. I want to lay in a hammock with him and trace the veins in his arms. I remind myself that I'm praying to the God who let the Israelites stay lost for decades. They begged to arrive in the promised land, but instead he let them wander, answering prayers they didn't pray. For 40 years, their shoes didn't wear out. Fire lit their path each night. Every morning, he sent them mercy bread from heaven. I look hard for the answers to the prayers that I didn't pray. I look for the mercy bread that he promised to bake fresh for me each morning. The Israelites called it manna, which means, what is it? That's the same question I'm asking again and again. There's mercy here somewhere, but what is it? Where is it? What is it? I see mercy in the dusty sunlight that outlines the trees, in my mother's crooked hands, in the blanket my friend left for me, in the harmony of the wind chimes outside my door. It's not the mercy that I asked for, but it is mercy nonetheless. And I learn a new prayer. Thank you. It's a prayer I don't mean yet, but will repeat it until I do. I know it sounds crazy, and I can't really explain it, but God is in there, even now. I've heard it said that some people can't see God because they won't look low enough, and it's true. If you can't see him, look lower. God is on the bathroom floor. <sighs> Honesty, giving real expression to frustration with God, Anger with God, doubting God, questioning God, and God gives us the freedom to express all those things to him. He can handle it. It's one of the reasons I love the Psalms. The Psalms are God giving us permission to feel what we feel without suppressing it. Realness that's accompanied by grace, that's believing in a God of grace who accepts you no matter what, who loves you no matter what, not based on your performance, but based on his performance for you. So we're the sanctuary. We're God's downstairs neighbors. We're a bunch of broken people who gather around the God who was broken for us, and we celebrate the miracle of God's grace, his unconditional love. That's who we are. And in the shadow of that love, we willingly expose our brokenness. We go first, we falter, we fail, and begin again. <laughs> it's really pretty screwed up and beautiful at the same time. We have no illusions of being something special, but we strive to be honest about ourselves and our need for God and each other. We are rising on lopped limbs because of God's great love. I need this place. You need this place. We need places like this. We all do, or else we spend our lives pretending, suppressing, changing out our masks by the hour, performing to get love, performing to get acceptance, performing to get approval, living on this performance treadmill that wears us out. We need one place once a week where we can exhale and rest and bask in the knowledge of knowing that God loves us and he's accepted us. And that doesn't mean that things in our lives will be easy. Of course, they won't be easy. They've never been easy. They're not easy now and they won't ever be easy. As you've heard me say, God promised in Psalm 23 to walk with us through the valley of the shadow of death, not to rescue us from it, good stuff that God is doing in your life and my life happens in the low places, the low places, the hard places, the difficult places. That's when things like empathy and quickness to forgive, um, grace and forgiveness toward others, that's where that stuff is developed. When you come face to face with your own messiness, you're not so scandalized by the messiness of the people around you. That's 
part of our problem in relationships that we actually think we're better than we are. So when someone that we love is messy or messes up, we're scandalized by it. It doesn't mean we're not hurt by that stuff. It doesn't mean that we don't struggle through the hurt of that stuff. We do. That's human too. But when we're scandalized by the fact that someone could mess up, it shows that we think we're better than that. And then we add struggle to our struggle. Our shock at this particular mess up becomes an additional struggle. Um, and so I, I'm so grateful to God for this space, for this place, for these people. Um, I've to, I think I said last week when Stacy and I were doing the table talk up here, there's not a week that goes by, not a week that goes by, almost not a Sunday that goes by for sure, Sunday afternoon especially, but there's, almost, there's not a week that goes by that I don't find myself at some point going, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? Like, is this, like, can, there's so many other things I could be doing, okay? M make more money too, <laughs> by the way, okay? There's, there's a lot of other things, and usually in those moments, I'm reminded by God through a conversation or a letter or some comment on social media or something that what God's doing here is special. It's unique. And God then reminds me, you need this place as much as everybody else. That's why you keep doing what you're doing. You keep going. You guys keep going because you need it as much as everybody else.